This is a paid advertisement for PH Law. Welcome to today's program. I'm Tony Noakes, and with me today is Dr. Wendy Walsh. Now, our topic on today's program will be of interest to any of our viewers or their loved ones who have suffered sexual harassment or sexual abuse. Dr. Walsh, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Tony. I'm pleased to be here. Dr. Walsh, before we get into today's topic, I want to take just a moment to let our audience know more about you and how you became interested in the area of sexual harassment and sexual abuse. Sure. Dr. Walsh teaches psychology at California State University, Channel Islands, is the author of three books on relationships, as well as the creator of thousands of articles, blogs, podcasts, and YouTube videos that reach millions around the world. And you may also have known her as a former host of the Dr. Phil spinoff, The Doctors, or as a regular commentator on CNN and Fox News. In line with our topic today, in 2017, Dr. Walsh bravely spoke out on behalf of silenced victims of sexual harassment at Fox News and was named a Time Magazine Person of the Year. Dr. Walsh, that's a very impressive background. Now, I'm sure our viewers are anxious to hear your views on today's topic. So, to begin, what motivated you to take such a public stand and become an advocate for victims of sexual abuse and sexual harassment? Well, Tony, first of all, thank you for that introduction. Uh, I think my mother would be happy to hear all those credits. Um, here's the thing. The New York Times came to me, and they had been digging up victim after victim after victim of sexual harassment. And in almost every case, the victims had tried to make a claim, been removed from their jobs, uh, were, became unemployable because then they were considered difficult women, and been forced to sign a non-disclosure agreement. Because after I was sexually harassed, I did not complain to anyone, there was no non-disclosure agreement, I was in a unique place where I was free to tell my story. And although I didn't really want to go on record because it was a very scary thing for people at the time, I just had to think about all the victims out there and even the ones who hadn't reported yet. I felt like I had to be a role model for others. Dr. Walsh, it seems like so many more people are being affected by sexual abuse and sexual harassment problems than in the past. So is this a new problem or one that has been there but not brought to the surface like has been recently? I don't think it's necessarily a new problem, Tony. I think sexual harassment has been going on a long time, but thanks to the Me Too and Time's Up movement, you're seeing more and more employees being brave and speaking out. And then as far as child sexual abuse, you know, thankfully there have been some great verdicts that brought some settlements uh, and help people heal through the process, right? And I think more and more people are being brave. They're starting to understand that they've been living with a lifetime of post-traumatic stress disorder because of events that happened to them as children. And so I just, I think people are being braver. However, when it comes to child sex abuse, I don't want to belittle the fact that it has become more common because not so long ago, if somebody were a sexual predator of a minor or sexually attracted to a minor, they usually didn't act on it. They lived alone and kept their dirty secret to themselves, but now they find community on the internet. They exchange photographs, they exchange videos of child pornography, and they become almost emboldened to finally act. So in many ways it is on the rise when it comes to child sex abuse. Never thought of it quite like that. Dr. Walsh, I can see where that has been true in so many cases, and, and I can also understand the effect the Internet may be having. One of the problems that victims of sexual harassment and sexual abuse have is that in many cases, the harassment or abuse happened many years ago, which I assume makes the cases more difficult to litigate. So why do so many victims fail to come forward when they are being abused? Well, it's a really complicated psychological issue because there's a lot of embarrassment. Believe it or not, there's a lot of guilt because children somehow always blame themselves. They think, what did I do wrong? And remember, the person who was their abuser was often a trusted family member or clergy member or sports coach, someone they trusted and someone they loved, right? And also, when you come forward, you're reliving your own trauma. You gotta tell the story again. Although I would say as a psychologist, there's a lot of healing in that storytelling and that's one of the ways to relieve some of your pain. Um, 
if the person has been a family member, it can be very uncomfortable to be talking about family members, and especially if you're accusing somebody who is a member of your church, because it makes you challenge your faith. So there are all kinds of reasons why people are, or traditionally, have been afraid to come forward. Dr. Walsh, it's hard for me to imagine how difficult it must be for these victims to make the decision to come forward and basically relive what has been so traumatic for them. Has anything been done to address time constraints like the statute of limitations that victims face when the abuse happened years ago? Well, this is the good news. We're seeing more and more states start to extend their statute of limitations. Uh, the statute of limitations is, you know, the time deadline for when victims of sexual abuse or sexual harassment can come forward and file a legal action. And it is different in every state. Now, in New York in particular, this prior year, a victim had to file before the age of 23. I mean, their prefrontal cortex is not even fully developed till they're 25. They're not even living the health, mental health and physical health problems of PTSD that can occur through middle age. So this was really unfair to victims since, as I said, so many victims don't wanna come forward until they're older, until they can make sense of it. So the state of New York has led the way with really meaningful legislation in this area. They now allow victims who were 23 years of age or younger to file a claim until they're 55 years old. But get this, you only have one year to do it. So it's a one year period uh, that began on August 14th, 2019 for anyone who was abused as a child in the state of New York. And what we're hoping here is that other states are going to follow New York's lead, that they're going to change their laws, that they're going to allow victims of sexual abuse to receive the recourse and the justice that they deserve. Absolutely. Those changes in the law giving sexual abuse victims more time to report the abuse will be very helpful given what they've gone through. Dr. Walsh, based on your experience, who are the typical potential perpetrators in these cases? Well, first of all, let's divide it between sexual harassment and child sexual abuse. When we're talking about workplace sexual harassment, there are two kinds. There's quid pro quo, meaning you do this favor for me and you can get paid more or get a promotion or get this job, right? And then there's hostile sexual environment where it's just a lot of locker room talk around the workplace. So the perpetrator might be a workplace superior, but it might be just other colleagues who are making it difficult for a woman to work and get her job done because of the hostility, the sexually hostile environment. When it comes to sexual abuse, child or adults, it could be family members, employees of schools, clergy, the Catholic Church, uh, Boy Scout leaders, summer camp coaches. Remember, people who are attracted sexually to minors deliberately get employed at places where they will have access to kids. Dr. Walsh, the information you're giving us today will be helpful to so many of our viewers and their families who have suffered sexual abuse or sexual harassment. Let's take a moment now to let our viewers know how they can reach our helpline where any immediate concerns that they may have can be addressed. We'll be right back. Have you or someone you know been a victim of childhood sexual abuse by a Catholic priest or clergy member, a teacher, or by a person involved with another community organization? You may be entitled to compensation even if the abuse happened years ago. Recent legislation passed by a number of state legislatures allows survivors of childhood sexual abuse a longer period to file a lawsuit, regardless of when the abuse occurred. With this additional time added to statutes of limitations, victims who suffered sexual abuse as a child but were reluctant to come forward in the past can now come forward and hold those responsible accountable. If you or a loved one has been a victim of childhood sexual abuse, you may be entitled to compensation. How do you fight for the compensation you deserve? You choose the right legal team that has the experience, support staff, and resources to get you the most compensation for your injuries. Time is limited to file a claim, so call now for a free case review. Welcome back to our program. For those of you who are just joining us, I'm Tony Noakes, and with me today is Dr. Wendy Walsh. On today's program, we're providing information on a topic we are sure will be helpful to any of our viewers and their families who have suffered sexual abuse or sexual harassment. 
Dr. Walsh, it's hard for me to imagine how difficult it must be for these victims to make the decision to come forward and basically relive what has been so traumatic for them. Dr. Walsh, based on your experience, who are the typical potential perpetrators in these cases? Well, first of all, let's divide it between sexual harassment and child sexual abuse. When we're talking about workplace sexual harassment, there are two kinds. There's quid pro quo, meaning you do this favor for me and you can get paid more or get a promotion or get this job, right? And then there's hostile sexual environment where it's just a lot of locker room talk around the workplace. So the perpetrator might be a workplace superior, but it might be just other colleagues who are making it difficult for a woman to work and get her job done because of the hostility, the sexually hostile environment. When it comes to sexual abuse, child or adults, it could be family members, employees of schools, clergy, the Catholic Church, uh, Boy Scout leaders, summer camp coaches. Remember, people who are attracted sexually to minors deliberately get employed at places where they will have access to kids. Oh my. Dr. Walsh, in the case of children who may have been subjected to potential sexual abuse, are there things that parents should watch out for, uh, indications that this may be happening to their child? Well, the most important thing is to listen to your child. If your child does not want to be around a certain adult, pay attention to their gut instinct because that is the most valuable. But young children, you may find, become bullies when they've been bullied. Uh, they might act out sexually with peers, right? They might be the first ones leading the way sexually. Well, where did they learn that? If they're particularly young, it might be um, sleep disturbances, nightmares, sudden bedwetting. If your child doesn't sleep in pull-ups anymore and all of a sudden starts bedwetting, you gotta ask why. And of course, fear of a potential activity that is associated with the adult. Parents need to stay tuned and stay focused on their children. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Walsh, in, in cases that involve public or private entities like schools, religious institutions, or the scouts, do they have potential liability or damages for these victims? Oh, they certainly do, Tony. Any church, school, or youth organization that is considered to have a special relationship with a child actually has a legal duty to protect that child from any kind of harm. Now. The key to this is that the organization must be held to have known or should have known of the potential for harm to the child. In cases where children were harmed and the child wasn't protected by that organization or institution, they could be held liable for damages. Has anything been done to address time constraints like the statute of limitations that victims face when the abuse happened years ago? Well, this is the good news. We're seeing more and more states start to extend their statute of limitations. Uh, the statute of limitations is, you know, the time deadline for when victims of sexual abuse or sexual harassment can come forward and file a legal action. And it is different in every state. Now, in New York in particular, this prior year, a victim had to file before the age of 23. I mean, their prefrontal cortex is not even fully developed till they're 25. They're not even living the health, mental health and physical health problems of PTSD that can occur through middle age. So this was really unfair to victims since, as I said, so many victims don't wanna come forward until they're older, until they can make sense of it. So the state of New York has led the way with really meaningful legislation in this area. They now allow victims who were 23 years of age or younger to file a claim until they're 55 years old. But get this, you only have one year to do it. So it's a one year period uh, that began on August 14th, 2019 for anyone who was abused as a child in the state of New York. And what we're hoping here is that other states are going to follow New York's lead, that they're going to change their laws, that they're going to allow victims of sexual abuse to receive the recourse and the justice that they deserve. Absolutely. Those changes in the law giving sexual abuse victims more time to report the abuse will be very helpful given what they've gone through. Can you tell us about the legal options victims of sexual abuse or sexual harassment have in terms of protecting their rights? I mean, as I understand, prosecution of these cases can be either civil or criminal. That's right, Tony. In fact, in the case of criminal prosecution, the government brings the action against the accused. Now, in these cases, the benefit to the victim 
might only be limited to the punishment received by the defendant. And also, these cases are really difficult because the burden of proof to convict is beyond a reasonable doubt. You've probably heard that term before, which is often really hard to establish. Now, there's another recourse, civil court. In civil cases where money damages are awarded, the burden of proof is called preponderance of the evidence or more likely than not, which is so much easier for a victim to establish. Although no amount of money can really compensate victims for what they've been through, money damages in many cases sometimes provide a new start for people. But I believe it is the process of telling the story, of feeling protected by attorneys and adults around you that really goes a long way to healing the psychological wounds. Oh, that's great that they have that option available to them. So when a sexual abuse victim chooses to file a civil lawsuit against a perpetrator, how does the legal process work and how long does it typically take? Well, the legal process usually starts with a meeting with a compassionate law firm a victim has chosen to protect them, really. During this meeting, the attorney will collect the information that he or she needs to begin developing the case against the perpetrator. Really, they're just going to be doing a lot of listening at the beginning. And this is what begins the process of building the case for the victim that can be quite extensive depending on the issues involved. The next step is filing the civil lawsuit against the perpetrator or the organization or the institution or all of the above. Although in many of these cases, a settlement is reached before a trial. I can say that the total time to a settlement can approach two years. As you've mentioned before, the embarrassment victims feel about their abuse or harassment experience is a big issue for them. So can you tell us about how privacy concerns are addressed in such cases? Sure, Tony, I want to tell you something. Confidentiality is paramount to any law firm who works in this area. And you're right, privacy concerns can be a big stumbling block for sexual harassment or sexual abuse victims because some of them are so afraid and they're very concerned about privacy. So it is really possible to file a case using a pseudonym, like a John Doe, Jane Doe. There are also confidentiality agreements that can protect victims from ever having their names known. It's really up to an individual victim to decide whether they want to go public or be on record or deal with it entirely privately. I'll tell you in my case, because I walked through the fire when it comes to sexual harassment in a big way with worldwide media attention. And I feel like after I walked through the fire, I felt more empowered than ever. So for me, it felt like a good thing to be on record, but that may not be the way for everybody. Sure, but just knowing they have privacy uh, at hand, it has to be reassuring to a victim. What is the cost for a victim to pursue a sexual abuse claim? Well, this is the good news, zero. Uh, you can meet with an attorney for free. You can call an attorney for free. Uh, you can tell them your story. They will tell you how solid of a case they believe you have, and they will work entirely on contingency fees, meaning that if you don't get money in a settlement, they get no money. And they won't go forward unless they're sure they've got a case and that they can protect you and your privacy. And many of these law firms work with trained professionals who have psychological training who can help guide you through this process in a very safe way. Dr. Walsh, the information you're giving us today will be helpful to so many of our viewers and their families who have suffered sexual abuse or sexual harassment. So let's take a moment now to let our viewers know how they can reach our helpline where any immediate concerns they may have can be addressed. We'll be right back. Have you or someone you know been a victim of childhood sexual abuse by a Catholic priest or clergy member, a teacher, or by a person involved with another community organization? You may be entitled to compensation, even if the abuse happened years ago. Recent legislation passed by a number of state legislatures allows survivors of childhood sexual abuse a longer period to file a lawsuit, regardless of when the abuse occurred. With this additional time added to statutes of limitations, victims who suffered sexual abuse as a child but were reluctant to come forward in the past can now come forward and hold those responsible accountable. If you or a loved one has been a victim of childhood sexual abuse, you may be entitled to compensation. How do you fight for the compensation you deserve? You choose the right legal team that has the experience, support staff, and resources to get you the most compensation for your injuries. Time is limited to file a claim, 
So call now for a free case review. Welcome back to our program. For those of you who are just joining us, I'm Tony Noakes, and with me today is Dr. Wendy Walsh. On today's program, we're providing information on a topic we are sure will be helpful to any of our viewers and their families who have suffered sexual abuse or sexual harassment. Dr. Walsh, it's hard for me to imagine how difficult it must be for these victims to make the decision to come forward and basically relive what has been so traumatic for them. Can you tell us about the legal options victims of sexual abuse or sexual harassment have in terms of protecting their rights? I mean, as I understand, prosecution of these cases can be either civil or criminal. That's right, Tony. In fact, in the case of criminal prosecution, the government brings the action against the accused. Now, in these cases, the benefit to the victim might only be limited to the punishment received by the defendant. And also, these cases are really difficult because the burden of proof to convict is beyond a reasonable doubt. You've probably heard that term before, which is often really hard to establish. Now, there's another recourse, civil court. In civil cases where money damages are awarded, the burden of proof is called preponderance of the evidence or more likely than not, which is so much easier for a victim to establish. Although no amount of money can really compensate victims for what they've been through, money damages in many cases sometimes provide a new start for people. But I believe it is the process of telling the story, of feeling protected by attorneys and adults around you that really goes a long way to healing the psychological wounds. Has anything been done to address time constraints like the statute of limitations that victims face when the abuse happened years ago? Well, this is the good news. We're seeing more and more states start to extend their statute of limitations. Uh, the statute of limitations is, you know, the time deadline for when victims of sexual abuse or sexual harassment can come forward and file a legal action. And it is different in every state. Now, in New York in particular, this prior year, a victim had to file before the age of 23. I mean, their prefrontal cortex is not even fully developed till they're 25. They're not even living the health, mental health and physical health problems of PTSD that can occur through middle age. So this was really unfair to victims since, as I said, so many victims don't wanna come forward until they're older, until they can make sense of it. So the state of New York has led the way with really meaningful legislation in this area. They now allow victims who were 23 years of age or younger to file a claim until they're 55 years old. But get this, you only have one year to do it. So it's a one year period uh, that began on August 14th, 2019 for anyone who was abused as a child in the state of New York. And what we're hoping here is that other states are going to follow New York's lead, that they're going to change their laws, that they're going to allow victims of sexual abuse to receive the recourse and the justice that they deserve. Dr. Walsh, in the case of children who may have been subjected to potential sexual abuse, are there things that parents should watch out for, uh, indications that this may be happening to their child? Well, the most important thing is to listen to your child. If your child does not want to be around a certain adult, pay attention to their gut instinct because that is the most valuable. But young children you may find become bullies when they've been bullied. Uh, they might act out sexually with peers, right? They might be the first ones leading the way sexually. Well, where did they learn that? If they're particularly young, it might be um, sleep disturbances, nightmares, sudden bedwetting. If your child doesn't sleep in pull-ups anymore and all of a sudden starts bedwetting, you gotta ask why. And of course, fear of a potential activity that is associated with the adult. Parents need to stay tuned and stay focused on their children. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Walsh, in, in cases that involve public or private entities like schools, religious institutions, or the scouts, do they have potential liability or damages for these victims? Oh, they certainly do, Tony. Any church, school, or youth organization that is considered to have a special relationship with a child actually has a legal duty to protect that child from any kind of harm. Now. The key to this is that the organization must be held to have known or should have known of the potential for harm to the child. In cases where children were harmed and the child wasn't protected by that organization or institution, they could be held liable for damages. 
Oh, that's great that they have that option available to them. So when a sexual abuse victim chooses to file a civil lawsuit against a perpetrator, how does the legal process work and how long does it typically take? Well, the legal process usually starts with a meeting with a compassionate law firm. A victim has chosen to protect them, really. The next step is filing the civil lawsuit against the perpetrator or the organization or the institution or all of the above. Although in many of these cases, a settlement is reached before a trial. I can say that the total time to a settlement can approach two years. As you've mentioned before, the embarrassment victims feel about their abuse or harassment experience is a big issue for them. So can you tell us about how privacy concerns are addressed in such cases? Sure, Tony, I wanna to tell you something. Confidentiality is paramount to any law firm who works in this area. And you're right, privacy concerns can be a big stumbling block for sexual harassment or sexual abuse victims because some of them are so afraid and they're very concerned about privacy. So it is really possible to file a case using a pseudonym, like a John Doe, Jane Doe. There are also confidentiality agreements that can protect victims from ever having their names known. It's really up to an individual victim to decide whether they want to go public or be on record or deal with it entirely privately. I'll tell you in my case, because I walked through the fire when it comes to sexual harassment in a big way with worldwide media attention. And I feel like after I walked through the fire, I felt more empowered than ever. So for me, it felt like a good thing to be on record, but that may not be the way for everybody. Sure, but just knowing they have privacy uh, at hand, it has to be reassuring to a victim. What is the cost for a victim to pursue a sexual abuse claim? Well, this is the good news, zero. Uh, you can meet with an attorney for free. You can call an attorney for free. Uh, you can tell them your story. They will tell you how solid of a case they believe you have, and they will work entirely on contingency fees, meaning that if you don't get money in a settlement, they get no money. And they won't go forward unless they're sure they've got a case and that they can protect you and your privacy. And many of these law firms work with trained professionals who have psychological training who can help guide you through this process in a very safe way. Dr. Walsh, thanks for joining us today. If you or someone you love has suffered sexual abuse or sexual harassment, there are attorneys available to advocate on your behalf. Call the number on your screen now. The consultation is confidential and free. Have you or someone you know been a victim of childhood sexual abuse by a Catholic priest or clergy member, a teacher, or by a person involved with another community organization? You may be entitled to compensation, even if the abuse happened years ago. Recent legislation passed by a number of state legislatures allows survivors of childhood sexual abuse a longer period to file a lawsuit, regardless of when the abuse occurred. With this additional time added to statutes of limitations, victims who suffered sexual abuse as a child but were reluctant to come forward in the past can now come forward and hold those responsible accountable. If you or a loved one has been a victim of childhood sexual abuse, you may be entitled to compensation. How do you fight for the compensation you deserve? You choose the right legal team that has the experience, support staff, and resources to get you the most compensation for your injuries. Time is limited to file a claim, so call now for a free case review. This is a paid advertisement for PH Law.